Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the last webinar of 2020. We are very happy to have you guys here with us. It is always fun, always exciting. We always get to explore so many different topics. My name is Kara Oosterhaus, and I'm the Western Canadian Agriculture Field Editor at Real Agriculture. And as I said, I am pleased to host today's webinar for the Simpson Center for Agricultural and Food Innovation and Public Education at the School of Public Policy. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, as you know, this will be a Q&A session at the very end. However, we have three speakers joining us today and they are gonna go back to back to back and feel free to submit any of your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom there. And you will be, uh, like I said, we won't get to them till after all three presentations are done, but submit them at any point, submit them while you're thinking of them um, and we will absolutely get to them. So thank you for joining us. We have a sneak peek of a soon to be published paper by Dr. Iman Fouli, Dr. Margot Hurlbert, and Dr. Roland Krebel. Dr. Fouli grew up in Tunisia where she studied geology and environmental engineering and later attended graduate school in Scotland and in the USA where she taught and conducted research in soil science. She continued with research in nutrient management and animal farming in Maryland and Saskatchewan and later joined a consulting firm in Alberta as an environmental scientist and project manager. She currently consults independently on water and soil quality, watershed management and climate change. Dr. Hurlbert research interests focused on energy, climate change, agriculture, and water. Margot has led and participated in many SSHRC, NSERC, and IDRC research products, serves on the editorial boards of international journals, is the lead of the science, technology, and innovation research cluster at Johnson Choyoma Graduate School of Public Policy in Regina. And last but not least, Dr. Krobel is an ecosystem modeler at AAFC Lethbridge and the science lead for AAFC's whole farm model HOLOs. As such, Roland is bringing together scientists from multiple disciplines in order to better represent Canadian farming systems and aims to use the HOLOs models model as a discovery and education platform for producers and educators alike. Starting with greenhouse gases, the model puts more emphasis now on soil carbon change, but aims in the very long run to expand into alternative production systems and ecosystem services. Iman, Margo, and Roland, I will let you guys jump in from here. Have yourselves a great presentation. I'm very much looking forward to it. And as I said, for any of you guys watching, please put those questions into the Q&A box whenever you feel them, and we will get to them right away. Thank you very much. Here we go. Hello, everybody. It's such a pleasure to be here to be able to talk to you about greenhouse gas emissions from Canadian agriculture. And so I would like to start with this diagram and ask the question, can we feed everyone on Earth without destroying Earth? So the answer is yes, and this presentation will attempt to explain how. I would like to introduce the greenhouse gas effect before discussing greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. Uh, and current greenhouse gas emissions from Canadian agriculture. We'll present emission estimates from livestock production and crop production, and we'll pass it on to Dr. Krobel, who will introduce methodologies for estimating uh, greenhouse gas emissions from Canadian agriculture. And Dr. Hurlbert will introduce policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from Canadian agriculture, and we will end with conclusions and recommendations. So here I'd like to present greenhouse gases and um, illustrate their impact on Earth. Greenhouse gases absorb and emit infrared radiation and cause the warming of the planet's surface. Although this warming is vital for life on Earth, um, accelerated surface temperature rises due to increases 
increased greenhouse gases in the atmosphere result in increasing atmospheric energy and rates of evaporation. And this causes unpredictable weather patterns such as heat waves, more intense and frequent droughts, wildfires, as well as more intense precipitation events. Rising temperatures can also affect ocean productivity and many species at sea and on land risk extinction or relocation. Uh, desertification and land degradation are putting food security and terrestrial ecosystems at risk. The main greenhouse gases are carbon dioxide, CO2, methane, CH4, and nitrous oxide, N2O, and ozone, O3. These gases have different radiative forces and global warming potentials. So in order to standardize the units, carbon dioxide equivalent is used by converting amounts of other gases to the equivalent amount of carbon dioxide with the same global warming potential over a hundred year time horizon. So for example, methane has a global warming potential of 25. So emitting one ton of methane is equivalent to emitting 25 tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And so similarly, nitrous oxide has a global warming potential of 298. So emit emitting one ton of nitrous oxide is equivalent to emitting uh, 298 tons of carbon dioxide. So in Canada, total greenhouse gas emissions amount to a total of about 729 megatons of carbon dioxide equivalent. So with about 80% emitted in the form of CO2. Methane emissions consist mainly of fugitive emissions generated by oil and, oil and natural gas systems, coal, mi uh, coal mining, uh, agriculture and animal waste management systems, landfills and wastewater. Nitrous oxide emissions result from agricultural soil management, energy and fuel combustion, industrial processes and waste management. So looking at the breakdown by sector, we see that the major greenhouse gas emissions in Canada, about 84%, are produced by oil and gas, transportation, buildings, heavy industry, and electricity. And about 10% of greenhouse gas emissions are produced by the agricultural sector. So agriculture is a major industry and a key driver of the Canadian economy, and it's highly at risk from climate change. Uh, left unchecked, the climate crisis will deepen the income crisis on Canada's farms as farmers struggle to deal with continued warming, more intense storms, increasingly unpredictable weather. So it really requires urgent adaptation responses to meet the demands of a growing population. Agriculture emits significant amounts of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere so that mitigation is part of many climate change response plans. Agriculture covers about 5% of Canada's land mass and about 80% of the agricultural land is located in the prairie provinces, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and Alberta. This map shows the percentage of ecozones that are farmed uh, and over 75% of the prairies are farmed. Uh, major agricultural land uses include cultivated lands, 37.7 uh, million hectares, and grasslands, 19.3 million hectares. And the main crops include grain crops, oil seeds, and pulses and forage crops. And livestock production in Canada includes 12.5 million cattle, 0.8 million dairy cows, 14 million pigs, uh, 145.5 million hens and chickens, and 1 million sheep and lambs, among other production systems. Emissions from uh, the agricultural sector result from losses in production processes, such as during animal digestion, loss of nutrient energy, and manure management. So agricultural greenhouse gas emissions in Canada have increased since 1990 from around 45 megatons of CO2 equivalent to about 59 megatons in 2018. And uh, this corresponds to 8.1% of total greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. So, however, this does not include energy sources of emissions from production processes, transportation and fugitive emissions during the production of nitrogen fertilizers. So when we add these energy emissions, we would increase the greenhouse gas emissions of Canadian agriculture to about 12% of total greenhouse gas emissions. The main greenhouse gases emitted by agricultural activities are nitrous oxide and methane, as seen in a central pie chart on this figure. Carbon dioxide is emitted from soils and from the use of fossil fuels for machinery and farm transportation, electricity and, and heating needs. Uh, carbon dioxide emissions account for about 26% of agricultural emissions. Nitrous oxide account for about 36% of agricultural emissions, mainly through direct release uh, from soils and manure management. And methane emissions account for about 38% of agricultural emissions and are mostly occur through enteric fermentation and manure management. So agriculture is both a source and a sink of greenhouse gases. 
the removal of atmospheric CO2 by soils is known as carbon, uh, soil carbon sequestration. And it resulted in a decline in net greenhouse gas emissions uh, between 1981, when the soils were a source, and 2011, when a source, the soils were a sink. This decline was evident in the Canadian prairies after the widespread adoption of beneficial management practices, such as reduced tillage, decreased summer fallow, and an increase in perennial instead of annual cropping systems. These practices minimize soil disturbances and allow soil carbon to accumulate naturally in soil organic matter instead of being released to the atmosphere. And uh, this figure shows that net emissions per hectare are generally higher in Eastern Canada than in Western Canada, which is mainly a result of the adoption of these best management practices, enhancing soil carbon sequestration. Also, the wetter climate in Eastern Canada frequently causes higher emissions of uh, nitrous oxide, especially with crops that are more demanding in nitrogen fertilizers, such as corn. So every agricultural product emits greenhouse gases as a result of its production. Uh, agricultural subsectors vary in their carbon footprint and estimating their footprint requires that we account for every single process that takes place uh, from the production uh, all the way up to the farm gate. So this figure is, I like it because it shows greenhouse gas emissions intensity data from a variety of subsectors on the same figure. So we have greenhouse gas emissions from uh, Canadian livestock production and animal commodities, and we see that they, they decreased between um, 1981 and 2006, especially for beef and pork production. And this decrease is mainly the result of improved management practices, better crop yields, more productive livestock breeds. And uh, these estimates did not include uh, changes in soil carbon. Um, it's complicated to estimate and compare greenhouse gas emissions from livestock operations that produce different products, like beef, pork, dairy, poultry, and sheep. Um, and they also use different production systems. So, so using protein as a common denominator uh, creates comparable measurements for each livestock commodity. Uh, Diarin Desjardins coined the term greenhouse gas protein indicator in 2010, and this figure shows greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of protein calculated using data for 2001. Um, protein produced from sheep and beef production had higher greenhouse gas emissions uh, than from other livestock commodities in Canada in 2001. And there are a couple of reasons for this. So both sheep and beef have lower fecundity rates and produce higher methane emissions during digestion than other livestock commodities. So using the protein indicator, Dyer and Desjardins in 2020, they investigated the impact of reducing red meat consumption, diversifying protein consumption, and changing cat cattle diets on greenhouse gas emissions uh, from livestock production in Canada. And they state that eating less meat and diversifying meat choices, consumers could significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions from agriculture. So whether in kilogram of CO2 equivalent per hectare, as you see here on the left, or in kilogram of CO2 equivalent per kil kilogram of dry matter produced, as shown on the right, uh, greenhouse gas emissions from cropping systems can be estimated for the major crops produced in Canada. These emissions were estimated using production and fertilizer data from Statistics Canada, and the changes in soil carbon were accounted for. Low values show that some crops such as alfalfa, lentils, chickpeas require lower fertilizer inputs than crops with higher greenhouse gas emission intensities such as corn and potatoes. Crops with low greenhouse gas emission intensities are usually legumes such as alfalfa and soybean, uh, which can fix nitrogen and have high soil carbon sequestration. And I now would like to pass it on to Dr. Kerbel. Thank you, Amin. Um, I'm going to quickly share my presentation. Um, as uh, was said in the beginning, I was asked to talk about measurements and um, models. Uh, but as you heard, I'm a model developer, so I can't actually talk in length about measurement methodology. But just quickly, um, the, the question of measurements is that, well, yes, they are more accurate, but uh, the problem with measurement equipment is that it can be highly expensive if you measure nitrous oxide emissions, for instance, you need a gas chromatograph, which costs uh, a multitude of money. And you need specialized machines uh, for the scientific uh, plot sizes that are not commercial plot sizes. So they can be quite uh, costly. And you need a lot of uh, human labor to process samples, measure samples, and so on. 
And all of this you do in one year, and then next year your weather is different. So you need to repeat this and repeat it over and over again. And then last but not least, um, Canada is a quite big country. And so trying to measure everywhere would be prohibitively expensive. And so this is where we do employ uh, models. Now, when I say models, I don't need mean these guys here, but in fact, uh, a mathematical equation that tries to represent what's going on in reality. Um, I've posted here the, the, the fertilized use efficiency equation, which is fairly simple and straightforward, but already you can tell that this is kind of a shortcut way of um, calculating uh, nitrogen use efficiency in terms of that we combine uh, different processes as to like the management practice of nitrogen application and then the biological uh, crop and uptake. So we're omitting a whole bunch of things in between that happens. And this is why we call those empirical models. Um, vice versa on that, then we have process models that try to capture everything in between. And so this is a flow chart here of the DNDC, the denitrification decomposition model um, that tries to represent all the processes that are going on in uh, agricultural soils in combination with the crops and the environment. And just as a kind of um, contrast to that, um, the nitrous oxide emission calculations that I say that is incorporated in the whole model. So there's multiple ways to do the calculations. You can do it very complicated uh, and you can do it very simple. That's what I'm trying to say. Um, the DNDC model itself as a, as a process model has been applied quite a bit in Canada. Um, there's a group in Ottawa that uses it to uh, calculate A, nitrous oxide emissions and um, uh, other greenhouse gas emissions, but also to estimate the effect of carbon change through res uh, residue management and uh, cropping choice. Um, other models like this is the, for instance, the century model. Um, this was actually used for the basis of the current national inventory report, uh, carbon change estimates. And uh, what was done in the past there was to use long-term field experiments and the management practices that have been uh, investigated there to try and upscale that to a Canadian national level and um, uh, basically then tie the, the carbon change that is estimated in the NIR with um, the management practices that have been investigated in these long-term field experiments. Um, a more up-to-date version of the century model is the, the descent model. And you can see from the flow chart kind of, um, they're very complex and uh, try to, to cover everything that's going on in the soil. So their focus really is like the, the soil in itself and understanding the bio biochemical uh, processes in there. Um, a different model, the Stix model, which is uh, primarily used by a group in, in Quebec and uh, originates from uh, France. Uh, you can see quite easily here that the, the focus of the, the crop model is the actual crop growth and then connected to that, um, the, the soil processes. Um, while these are very uh, site-specific models, um, we have other models like the integrated farm system models that then try to um, look at the, the whole farm system and incorporate everything that's going on on a farm rather than just uh, on a specific field. And this is also the corner in which uh, our holders model falls. But um, you, can, you can kind of um, see from the flow charts that say I've, I've sorted them kind of going from very complex to getting simpler and simpler. And the holders model being the only one in this group of models that is actually developed with the purpose to be handed out to um, the non-scientific community, while all the others are usually uh, operated and utilized by scientific users. Um, just as a quick overview then for the models, um, Descent, DNDC, and STIX um, oriented as a set kind of on the, on the salt geochemical uh, processes and as well the, the, the crop growth but them being very uh, field site specific. So we run them on a, on a single field and we can try to upscale from there. Um, the Century and ICBM model who have to focus on, on soil carbon change 
um, the century model more on a, on a regional scale and uh, more easily upscale to a national level. Um, the ICBM model is actually field site specific, but we're currently working with Environment Canada to try and see whether we can upscale this to a national level. And then the IFSM model um, built originally for the purpose of uh, presenting a dairy farm system, and I'm putting their US in the brackets because that's where it's from. Um, it's nevertheless quite applicable to Canadian dairy systems. And the model developer since has um, expanded the model to encompass other livestock. And then our own uh, HODAS uh, model, which is the purpose to calculate greenhouse gas emissions and soil carbon change, but is specifically designed for Canadian farm systems and tries to cover all the livestock and all the crops that are grown in Canada. Um, just so much from, from my side, if you have more questions, uh, please contact HODAS and Canada.ca and we can tell you more about the HODAS model. But with that, I'm handing off to Margot. Okay, I think I'm unmuted. I'm going to speak on uh, the policies in relation to agriculture and measures. I think Emen did a great job covering the measures that happen on farm in relation to reducing greenhouse gases, moving to perennial crops at farm management, livestock manure management. Uh, there's a specific program on for our nutrient stewardship that is uh, developed by the federal government and implemented in the provinces in different ways. And of course, Emen mentioned no-till practices and some of the farm equipment management practices that are available. So what um, specific practices are uh, advanced by policies? And I'll cover just briefly some of the provinces and then speak a bit more high level and generally coming back to some of these policies. So carbon pricing is a really important greenhouse gas policy in relation to our economy and industry, but also specific to agriculture. And by that, a way of thinking about it is a levy on fuel and gasoline, which we know is very um, carbon intensive. So in Alberta, there's a carbon offset market where producers who increase efficiency and reduce their emissions can earn extra income. And there's four approved protocols that Alberta has for these carbon offsets, including conservation cropping, uh, practices around cattle, using uh, waste for micro generation of renewable energy, livestock waste, um, biogas production. So those very specific measures have been endorsed by Alberta. Saskatchewan has a different approach. It has a prairie resilience plan. And in that plan, it has measurable targets, including a climate resilience measurement framework. And some of the indicators by way of example include the percentage of land that is employing the for our nutrient stewardship plan that I mentioned previously, which really aims at reducing the amount of uh, nutrients on land and thus greenhouse gases coming through, increasing the total amount of protected grasslands, protected areas and measuring that amount. And of course, Saskatchewan is subject to the federal carbon tax and there's an ability of agricultural producers to apply for an exemption through that program. Manitoba, like Saskatchewan, is subject to the federal carbon tax with that exemption I men mentioned and has a Manitoba Sustainable Agricultural Practice Program and an farm, Environmental Farm Action Program and a riparian tax credit. So using tax credits to actually incentivize agricultural producers and others to preserve wetlands, which we also know are a good source of uh, a good sink to 
uh, employ um, retaining that carbon in the land. So just by way of comparison, I'm showing on this slide some of the carbon pricing uh, and where it sits across the country. And as we know, the federal government with Manitoba and Saskatchewan, those, that pricing will be increasing uh, over the next couple of years. So globally, emission trading systems are actually very efficient systems for reducing agricultural emissions. And I should point out at the get-go, that there isn't one magic or better uh, policy instrument that in relation to agriculture, we actually need a policy suite uh, of measures in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions in agriculture. And for the most part around the world, there is a deficit in capturing all of agricultural practices and processes within a greenhouse gas uh, accounting verification reporting system. So uh, places like the EU, Switzerland, Korea, Quebec and Canada, California have emission trading systems, but for the most part, none have included the non-CO2 like methane, nitrous oxide emissions from agriculture. Furthest along would be New Zealand uh, is one of the countries that's contemplating and has uh, plans in relation to including these in relation to agriculture. And partly because they're such an agricultural based country and it's really required and necessary in order for them to reduce their em emissions and meet Paris commitments. Concerns around including agriculture in these uh, emission trading systems, of course, is food prices. If food prices go up, how will that impact uh, food security? Carbon linkage, if New Zealand starts doing this and other countries don't, uh, how will that impact imports and exports? And in any event, we'll have the same global emissions because people will just buy from countries that don't have carbon taxes on agriculture. So can we do border adjustments to adjust for this? But what uh, level should we be implementing carbon pricing and carbon uh, verification or reporting? Is it at the farm gate or the processor level? So there's a lot we don't know in the policy area. So Imen mentioned the uh, efficiency effectiveness of agricultural best management practices, which for the most part in Canada, we employ in the manner of a carrot. So we offer incentives, financial reward for these practices. And in Alberta, Saskatchewan and Manitoba, each province has a policy surrounding these in somewhat different uh, forms and with somewhat different uh, specifics around how they are employed. But the farming for land, the nitrogen use, the fertilizer, those programs apply in all jurisdictions being uh, federal provincial programs and uh, are very important going forward. So carbon taxes are effective, they're low cost, but they aren't the uh, only solution for agriculture. Cap and trade systems are generally more cost effective, but a combination of both is required. As to date, the agricultural system hasn't been fully exposed. And so there's much we don't know in the policy sciences around this issue. Internationally, standards and certificates around carbon accounting and not reducing our wetlands for more production, these types of measures are becoming increasingly important if people are going to be buying our agricultural uh, outputs uh, internationally. They want to know that we're abiding by these standards and certificates, another sort of carrot measure. But there's big questions left in agriculture including what the current status of agricultural greenhouse gas emissions reporting is. We don't really have a comprehensive internationally agreed to accounting verification reporting system in relation to soil and agricultural uh, emissions. So to what degree do we need to make change? What's the best pathway for achieving these changes? And how will agricultural producers uh, know that their new practices have achieved the target level of change that's required. So that's just a brief overview of some of the policy implications and I am going to return it back to Kara.
Thank you very much, Margot. Uh, it was a great presentation and Roland and Eman. It is wonderful to uh, hear all the different perspectives and what is going on. So we are going to now head into the Q&A portion of our presentation. Uh, of our uh, webinar here. So we do have a couple questions that have already come in. Um, so thank you very much for that. And as we keep going, please feel free to throw your questions into the Q&A box below. So Iman, Margo and Roland, if you guys can turn on your cameras. Yes, awesome. And uh, the first question actually here, it's kind of a big one. Um, so bear with me if you need me to repeat it again, I absolutely will. Can you comment on how looking at greenhouse gas emissions for specific food choices can overlook other environmental benefits? For example, Canada's native grasslands are one of the most endangered ecosystems in the entire world, and what little remains is largely under the care of beef farmers, preserving habitat for species at risk while sequestering carbon. Therefore, reducing beef consumption for decreased emissions can have unintended consequences. Does anyone have any comments on that? I can weigh in. Okay. I think I think this is actually one reason why it's so important to start thinking about a comprehensive accounting verification and reporting system in relation to greenhouse gases. I think uh, from what little I learned on the land and climate report of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change is if we don't get ahead of the curve and start looking at a system that will give and measure benefit of retaining grasslands and retaining wetlands and our practices of mintil and how these have improved soil and the capturing of carbon in soil. If we don't get ahead of the curve, I think we get lumped in with beef practices around the world, which don't uh, don't take into account that in Western Canada and in Southern Alberta and Southern Saskatchewan, we have these grasslands that they can't be farmed and that our beef industry is protecting them and those grasslands are sequestering carbon. So to take our beef production and compare it to some sort of intensive livestock operation somewhere else in the world where livestock's raised intensively uh, and not in as sustainable a manner, I think we need to get ahead of the curve and make sure that we can actually account, verify, and report that our practices are uh, more uh, greenhouse gas, more sustainable. They're actually storing more carbon than some of these intensive livestock operations. Absolutely. And if I may add on to that, um, so, as uh, well, the Canadian Cattlemen Association already knows about our paper where we looked at the greenhouse gas footprint of beef production uh, over time, where we found that it actually went down. But um, the connection to ecosystem services is something where our scientific understanding is still somewhat lacking in terms of that we have uh, anecdotal evidence, but we're yet not there to give like a conclusive recommendation where we can say you can be assured that this is the consequence and this is ultimately what is needed by the policy makers um, to get the scientific certainty to justify their policy implementation and this is something where unfortunately we scientists aren't just quite there yet and on, on that side, uh, also, we're not meant to make policy in the first place. So uh, we have to, to finish our scientific work and then get a transport allowed to the policymakers. Uh, and in Canada, with the whole differentiation of federal versus provincial policy making, that complicates things on top of it. Okay, thank you very much, Roland. I'll just add on to that. Oh, sorry, you it, it also crosses over into the min till practices. So we all know that min till retains carbon in soil, but at an international level in the peer reviewed literature, that conclusion doesn't really resonate or come out. And part of the reason is it doesn't have the peer reviewed literature. And the second reason is uh, some of the agricultural scientists are, are, are 
skeptical because mint hill and increased uh, use of phosphorus seem to go hand in hand. So they're questioning uh, questioning our position in the prairies that mint hill is actually sequestering carbon. So we, we need to get the science, we need to get it, it published in peer reviewed journals so it can make it to the international IPCC level and into the uh, global stock take uh, and, and Canada can get recognition for these practices and this accounting. Absolutely. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to the next question here, just because we've got quite a few uh, coming in and we want to get to as many as we possibly can. Um, so this question here says, I have yet to meet a farmer or rancher who has received a carbon credit. I understand that if you use zero till, you can receive a carbon credit one time only. Why can't we find a system that really works? Any comments from anyone? I can, I can only, again, uh, argue from the scientific side. So I, say, I, I know that, um, well, if you haven't met a farmer that hasn't uh, received a carbon credit, then this is probably due to the fact that uh, these farmers haven't yet applied for a carbon credit. So it's not something where the province is going to go around, but it's the farmer who has to go and get it. Um, in terms of the carbon credit implementation, yes, you will only get once a carbon credit because the whole carbon change question is basically tied to a management practice change. And uh, with each management practice change, you get a diminishing return. So we can basically forecast in the sense that um, if you apply a certain practice, like switching from reduced tillage to no-till, you will get a carbon gain out of this, but this carbon gain is finite and doesn't continue endless into the future. And this is why you get an only one-time uh, payment. Any other comments or is that good? Good, okay. Um, so our next question here is, thank you for these excellent and informative presentations. Do you happen to know what proportion of Albertan and Canadian beef is produced in feedlots versus produced on extensive rangelands that play such an important role in grassland conservation? Also, taking into consideration that many cattle that are raised on extensive grasslands are finished in feedlots, this is such a complex topic. Thanks so much for your time. Roland, you're nodding like you might have something to say. Well, it's a, it's a, yes, it is complex and, and basically, well, and uh, if we talk from the, from the science side about this, we always uh, think of the, the beef system, so to say the production system in itself being the most complicated of the production systems. Um, the point is there that uh, in essence, all Canadian uh, beef is raised most of the time on grassland and um, the finishing is, uh, say, the end period of their lifetime, and almost all Canadian beef goes through feedlots. Now, this may not be a, an exact uh, answer to your question, but that's just a little bit of it. Does anyone else have any comments on the matter? Margo, yes? No, okay. <laughs> no worries. Um, so, Another one here is there has been some research done on reducing enteric emissions with different feed additives. Are you aware of any that are effective and do not impair productivity? Roland? Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so, so in the HONAS model, uh, and we got criticized for this in, in our old version, uh, one of the supplements that you could feed is, is fat. And there is a known effect uh, if you add two or up to 4% fat to the diet, then that has a distinct um, decrease of enteric methane associated with it. Um, there's other methods um, that have been investigated like feeding tenants, but uh, we didn't incorporate it in the model because the scientific literature, the publications uh, do not have a clear cut response. Um, there's other um, supplements now being in the pipeline and being investigated um, that have a more distinct um, effect. Um, and I think they will hit the market pretty soon. So I don't want to do um, advertisement at, at this point. Um, the point though is that so far all the supplements that are effective except the fat 
um, is something where the producer actually has to um, live with an associated cost of this. And we don't, as far as I know, have a policy element in place that would offset those costs. The next one here is uh, there have been a lot of research in reducing methane emissions in Alberta. Do you know of any specific research that is at a point where it can actually benefit the livestock industry rather than hurt it? Yes, I am. <laughs> And I would recommend you um, pose these questions to Dr. Karen Boschemann, who works at the Lethbridge Research Center at EFC. And she will probably be able to answer this question with more detail than you hope for. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, how much of an effect will the growth in the acceptance of plant-based meat substitutes have on these emission numbers? Margo? <laughs> so moving to a plant-based diet, I think Yiman, Yiman, you should talk to. Uh, moving to a plant-based diet was something that the IPCC and the Land and Climate Report identified as very, very important for reducing emissions. So not going vegetarian, but reducing meat around the world. And it doesn't mean, it does not mean that it's appropriate in all places. So very different cultural context specific people and specific uh, places, but it is important and it is an important um, branding, I think, in Canada for our food industry and our ability to contribute to that market, but also continue to have our livestock production um, exported uh, in a sustainable manner. Iman, would you like to add yes. anything? Yes, I would agree with that. And I would say that there is a, a lot of research happening now on, on keeping a balance with uh, animal production so that it's not 100% beef, it could be 25 to 75 uh, ruminant, non-ruminant, um, so that would decrease the methane emissions. And then of course, with the diets, um, yes, there's a lot of support with plant-based uh, proteins. Um, they don't uh, maybe uh, fulfill the diet as well as the animal-based proteins, but uh, they have great, um, you know, uh, they, they do a great job. So they're just keeping a balance so that the economy can keep going and farmers can keep producing um, the meat products that they wish to produce um, in a sustainable way. So Margot kind of commented on this, um, but I'm curious, Iman, this is another question here. What are your thoughts on the public prom promotions by large corporations such as a and and McDonald's as their sustainable beef? So what do you mean uh, in terms of um, what they're doing? For um, I think I think the question here is just what are what are some of your thoughts on how they are publicly promoting sustainable beef, how they're they're taking to some of their ad campaigns and and stuff like that. Um, I would like to just find out more about um, what they mean by sustainable beef. What what exactly are their sustainable management practices? And um, yeah, if if they are, then that's great. Um, but uh, we we can all think about um, the way we conduct our um, you know the way we consume and what we do uh, for the economy and for. Uh, our emissions um, and, and our practices and if we can find anything that, any sustainable uh, practices to keep the economy going um yeah I would totally encourage them if they're doing the right thing yeah okay Margo you were nodding your head is there anything else you'd like to add yes and I'm I'm not 100 percent aware of of like Inen what they mean by sustainable but I have seen supporting local beef and taking transportation charges out of the equation uh, because of the big greenhouse gas emissions that are involved in transport is one measure of uh, advancing sustainability. So supporting local. Absolutely. Okay, we have time for one last question here before we wrap up. Um, in your perspectives, what are the biggest opportunities to educate the public to support lowering our GHG emissions associated with food while not turning people off of the message when there's been such a cultural focus in Alberta on Alberta beef? Thanks so much. Do you have any comments? Margot, Iman, Roland? 
I, I can go first or first. I, th I think it's it's following along to this discussion. It coming together in forums like this, where we get Roland, who's incredibly knowledgeable, and Inen together and start looking at our policies and how they fit together, what's missing, what uh, what carrots, uh, what what education, what programs, what advertising advances sustainability. And we, we don't have the answers. There's, a, there's quite a gap in, in what sustainability is. We know certain things though. We know um, BMPs, we know reducing greenhouse gases through reduced transportation. So if we can bring people together and, and start the discussion, I, I just think it's going to be the best way. Yes, I totally agree. I think it's all about starting this conversation going and there's so many uh, parts of this conversation, um, you know, in terms of policy, in terms of science, in terms of people consumers, what can they do to feel better because it's a, it's an emergency nowadays and we can't, uh, maybe we can't wait for policies to be made. What can we do ourselves? You know, we can make choices on what we consume, we can find out more. Um, uh, we have the we have the the chance to have a choice in in this country as opposed to other places farms in the middle of nowhere that have degraded land and a couple of animals they're trying to survive on what choices do they have at least we have choices we can make and um, whether we're in urban or whether we own land and so um i think there's a lot that can be done locally as well as uh, globally roland any last thoughts yeah, I think uh, we, we've got our work cut out as scientists to, to kind of put down the, the understanding and the measures to see what is there in the moment. I think um, there will probably have to come a point where Canadians will have to have a, a conversation about how they want the Canadian land to be used. And this comes in lieu of what, what the CCA was saying in terms of um, that we have certain production practices um, associated with certain land use and land cover. And changing how we nutrition ourselves may have an impact on how these lands are used and covered. And so the question is that we have to answer all together as Canadians, um, what do we want then with this land? How, should, how do we want it to look like? And um, maybe greenhouse gas emissions is not the only factor that should play a role there. But again, this is a value and policy question that I, as a, on the scientific side, cannot provide an answer for. Well, thank you very much for your insight anyways, Roland. And Iman and Margo, your presentations were very interesting today. And we appreciate all your uh, ability to answer these questions. like like uh, Roland kind of alluded to, sometimes it's not always easy, but I very much appreciate you guys doing that. So uh, fortunately we, we have come to the end of our Q and A session. It always goes by so quickly. Uh, thank you guys for all your insight and thank you to those who are watching the webinar today and to all of you that sent in questions. I know we didn't get to a lot of them. Um, there were so many questions that came in. So if you have any, please, uh, reach out uh, to SPPRSVP at ucalgary.ca and we will direct you to the correct uh, the correct person and we'll try and get you guys answers however we can. Um, this was the last webinar of the year, as I said earlier, but we are looking forward to the 2021 series. There will be all sorts of interesting topics coming your way. So once again, thank you very much for tuning in. We always appreciate it. If you have any suggestions or feedback, like I said, please reach out to the School of Public Policy. And that email once again is sppRSVP at ucalgary.ca. Thanks again, everyone, and take care. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for having us.